Thanks for your interest in Miami Hurricanes football coverage on the Our Lads Football Network. Let's take a look at some recent clips with Gary Furman of Canesport.com. The bottom line is, it's football. Aren't you football. excited? Oh, my God. I, I mean, this is the longest off season I can ever remember. I mean, you, you dated me, Greg. You, you had to say 40 years. But, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's been 40 years of, of covering the Hurricanes. And uh, th this is absolutely the, the longest off season that I've ever had in my life. I mean, when you look at the way Miami finished the year last year, how difficult that was to first cover and then deal with because, you know, you couldn't just pretend that it didn't happen. I mean, it was an absolute train wreck at the end of the season last year. And, you know, so that was tough, you know, have, having to be, you know, blunt and, and, and point out the different things that, it, that, that might be wrong with the program. And then to go through this whole coronavirus thing and uh, not having a spring practice, not knowing if there's going to be a football season, but still having to cover the team like there is a football season. And now here we are. I got to give Manny Diaz an absolute A plus for the way he's handled this off season. I mean, not just in dealing with the coronavirus, but um, so many coaches and Greg, you've, you've like, like me have been around football for so long. And um, so many coaches are in such denial when they have problems and um, they kind of like go into a shell. They, they hide from the criticism. They don't look inwardly and, and admit their flaws. Well, Manny Diaz has done none of that. Okay. And, and um, you know, he, obviously got his butt kicked last year in his first year as a head coach. And from the minute he got back from Shreveport where they lost 14, nothing to Louisiana tech, um, he started attacking his problems one by one. And, um, you know, he got himself a new offensive coordinator. It's not necessarily that, um, Rhett Lashley is a better football coach than Dan Enos. So I'm not sure we could say that right now in either direction, but, He's different, and and it's more along the lines of what people have been looking for in this modern day of Miami football and the way they play high school football in South Florida. So whether the plays are better, I don't. I think is kind of irrelevant. The the, the bottom line is people are going to think the plays are better, and and it's it's just you know jump started the whole mindset around the program, and then they go out together and they get the Eric King. Oh yeah, who's huge, huge, huge. Yes, I mean that's that's program trans transformational in my opinion, based on what I've seen so far, but I should say potentially program sure. transformational, um, you know, so, and, and then they, they just, you know, kept going on from there. They, they went and got other, other transfers. They got themselves a, a right tackle who's better than anybody they had. They got, they got a, a defensive end from temple who gave them depth initially. And now they really need them because uh, Greg Rousseau decided to opt out. Uh, this year, they got themselves a kicker after having, you know, losing arguably two or three games last year because they couldn't kick simple field goals and extra points. They got themselves a transfer kicker that they now feel that ha has solved that problem. So if you did not have these moves that Manny Diaz has made, Greg, you might be sitting here with me right now. We might be saying, man, you know, this Miami team might not win more than four games this year. Yeah, but. But but that's not the case. They, you know, these moves have really provided a great deal of hope. All right. Now, uh, that's in the books. And every week we are going to kind of start now. And that is we're going to talk about what's going on during 2020. Might take a look a little bit uh, about what happened in the previous week's games, especially not only for Miami, but their opponent. And their opponent this week is UAB. Now, UAB... For the Power Five fan, they don't have the cachet. We get it. But you're talking about a program in the group of five that is it's been one of the best stories, really, over the last few years with Bill Clark. I'm shocked Bill Clark hasn't been – I mean, when I look around every year, or the last couple of years, I should say, at head coaching opportunities, I'm, I'm just shocked I don't see Bill Clark's name in there. I see a bunch of other names of coaches that I don't think are as good as Bill Clark. But Bill Clark has done a fantastic job with a program that was dead three years ago, just dead after the 2014 season. 
And not, I mean, he has resurrected this program to one of the top teams in Conference USA. They've averaged eight and a half wins since he's been there. This will be his fifth year. They have 18 returning starters. This is not an easy opponent for Miami. UAB is, again, one of the better group of five teams that they're going to face. Now, what UAB has been really good at, especially when, uh, even though it's been a few years now that they're back to playing uh, FBS football, that just the fact that being that underdog, and as an underdog, they have been a great spread team. That's been different, though, when they are in the favorite role or when they really go into the dog role and step up in competition to play the Power 5 schools. They have played five Power 5 schools. They have not won any of them. They've only covered one of them, which was the first Power 5 school Bill Clark played. So they're, they've, they've, they've dropped four straight covers and never won a Power 5 game by an average margin of 199 to 85. This is Kane Sports Inside the Lines with Gary Furman, publisher of canesport.com, the top authority of Miami Hurricanes football. Gary, good to talk to you again. Hey, how you doing this week, Greg? I'm doing good, and uh, the Canes fans are doing good too because uh, a win's a win. And especially over the last few years, uh, you take any win you can get it, especially in the first game. Uh, we talked about this last week. UAB was one of the better teams in the group of five. Miami's had their share of issues uh, with, with, with teams that they're supposed to beat. Uh, it wasn't a clean game, but we didn't expect a clean game. But the win's a win. And now comes the important game, the ACC road opener at Louisville. You know, Greg, what I really liked was the fact that they played a real game in the opener. You know, so often you see a FAMU or a Bethune scheduled yeah. into, that, Wagner. into that slot. Wagner, yeah. <laughs> and, and I just, I've never felt that a football program gets a whole heck of a lot out of those games. I mean, it's kind of like a dress rehearsal, but to me, if the coaches are good, you can get that done on the practice field. And what I really liked about this game was that UAB was a representative team. They could walk and chew gum. And I thought they, they tested Miami a little bit in, in certain areas. And they certainly made them respond in the third quarter when they pulled to within a field goal. And Miami did respond. And they responded in a big-time way. And, and I think that's going to help them on the road this weekend at Louisville, which is a tougher opponent and a team that figures to challenge them a little bit more. But at least they've been through it, and they know that if they're in a tough spot, that they can take it to another level. Yeah, and this is a game that actually was not originally scheduled before the COVID. So not only Louisville, but Clemson as well. Uh, but that's okay. It's, it's, it's a good road opener. And as we mentioned last week, Scott Satterfield, both coaches, second year coaches trying to rebuild these programs. And, and this is a big game in that year two rebuild for both coaches. They have the capability of putting up a lot of points. And um, that's why I felt it was so important that the Miami offense established itself a little bit last week. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised, Greg, if this is a shootout this weekend and, uh, you know, maybe first to 35 or 40 wins. And this should be a wide open, exciting affair on Saturday night. All right. Now, uh, let's get into our trends of the week. Yeah, this is my favorite part. I like to hear what you've come up with here. All right. Uh, we're going to give... By, by the way, I, listen, I got to give you a shout out for last week because the trends you had last week were really spot on. Um, they worked. You know, UAB against Power 5 competition right. was not very good. They were not good against the spread, and Miami covered the spread. The ACC home opener against arch rival Florida State, Gary. So it's a big week for Miami Hurricanes football. Always a big week when Florida State comes to town, Greg. And, you know, there'll only be 13,000 fans on the stands. But I don't think that diminishes the importance of the game. Uh, you know, Florida State's coming off a loss in their opener. They're trying to get some traction under the, a new coach. And Miami has just been reinvigorated by everything that's happened in the offseason, by the way they've started the year. And um, with Clemson coming up next after Florida State, uh, without question, a, a huge, huge evening for Miami on Saturday night. Miami's got it going pretty good right now, and um, I'm personally expecting uh, a convincing Miami victory. Oh, wow. All right. Already uh, making a prediction. I guess that's it. We'll see you next week, everybody. Uh, no. <laughs> so, uh, because last year, Miami was three and six straight up. 
and and uh, two and seven against the spread as a favorite under Diaz this year. They're already two and zero oh, straight up and against the spread as a favorite, and and those are the types of trends that are very important because that's telling you that when you're favorite, you're taking care of business. You're doing what you're supposed to do. And that's something they didn't do last year. Now, here's a couple other uh, trends that favor Miami in the game. Uh, Mike Norville, okay, he's coached in nine games in four years at Memphis when his team was a road dog. He's won one. He's one and eight. Wow. Straight up and wow. against the spread as a road dog. So that's a it's a bad sign for Florida State. Good sign for Miami. Uh, also, uh, the penalties have got to come down. Uh, too many penalties uh, in the game against Louisville. So when you start, when you step up a competition uh, in a couple of weeks, you took on Clemson. If you expect to hang with them, uh, you can't give a great team gifts. So uh, hopefully this week will be a good week to start limiting the flags. I love measurement games, and I, and I love to to find out exactly where the Miami program is and 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 how good it how good it might be or or where it might still be lacking. And, and I don't think that I was, that anybody really was able to get a true read out of the first three games. We know they're vastly improved. We know Rhett Lashley as the offensive coordinator has made a massive difference in this program in transforming Miami football. We know they've had a national stage now. It's because this is going to be the third time in four games that they're on primetime ABC, which is absolutely astonishing when you look at where they're coming from at the end of last season. So it is nothing but a, a festival of happiness down here in South Florida. And um, to be able to go up to Clemson and play a program that for nine years now has just been the prototype, not just in the ACC, but right there with the Bamas of the world in, in college football, I think it's the perfect time, um, the perfect moment from Miami to, to, to go up there and, and just see where they are as a program right now. He's obviously going to be the first pick in next year's draft. What's the difference that you're seeing in Trevor Lawrence so far this season than uh, seasons before? Well, it's pretty obvious. He's worked on some mechanical things in the off season with his feet and just perhaps a little thing here or there just to perfect what he already had, which was near perfection. And, you know, being a year older, Last year, a sophomore after the great freshman year when they won the national championship, he probably felt early on that he was Superman and he could throw a football anywhere he wanted to and it would only go to his guys. And he threw some early picks. And, of course, now he's on a long streak of no interceptions. He just looks very sharp, very comfortable. Obviously, the game has slowed way down for him. He's in complete control out there. And you can't forget his legs as well. I mean, Clemson will use him a lot in the running game. People don't expect that from a guy who's that tall, but he runs very well and he runs very hard. I'll throw one thing in there really quick that he is Superman. Okay. Um, we saw him a couple of years ago at the rivals five-star challenge <laughs> when he was a high school quarterback. And I mean, I was in awe from the first time I saw him throw a ball and I came back the next day and I happened to see Mark Rick at a, at another event. And I said, Mark, yeah, you have no idea what's coming down the pike here at Clemson. They got this quarterback coming in by the name of Trevor Lawrence. And, you know, he's as good as a high school quarterback as I've ever seen in, in, in 40 plus years of, of doing this. So, you know, and, and he certainly has not disappointed uh, since he arrived at Clemson. And this will be the last year they have him. Um, but, man, I hope every, all you guys up there in South Carolina just totally appreciate what you got there because, I mean, the kid is obviously really special. The name you brought up last, Phil, and that's Travis uh, Etienne. Because Lawrence is this once-in-a-generation quarterback that comes out of a school, and maybe it's twice with Deshaun Watson. That's another question a little bit later on. But Etienne is such a dynamic running back that every all the attention will be on Lawrence at the draft. But Travis Etienne might be the most talented running back that I've seen in the draft in several years because of his receiving ability, which is so important at this uh, at today's game in the NFL. And uh, I just think that he is going to have a fantastic pro career. See no reason why he won't. Uh, I mean, even if he goes to the Jets, as pitiful as they are. Hey, I mean, now. That's my team. I'm sorry. But, it, you know. Um, that's where Trevor's going. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry. You're talking about Travis now. Yeah, Travis. Well, wherever Travis ends up, 
Right. Uh, he should be a star as well. I, I haven't seen a running back with his kind of explosiveness. I mean, I'm sure there have been some, sure. but I mean, his ability to go from zero to 60 is, is really incredible. Uh, he has improved other aspects. That's why he came back. He wanted to further improve other aspects of his game, like picking up the blitz, like uh, receiving out of the backfield. And he has done that. We already knew he could run the football with the best. And Clemson has been very judicious with its use of him because they're loaded at running back and they've had so many blowout games. I mean, if he gets 20 carries in a game, that's uh, an achievement. He seldom is above 15 carries. So the wear and tear on a four-year college running back on him will not be like it is on another yeah, uh, running back at a program. Yeah, he won't have that wear and tear on the body. He's still got a lot of miles left in those legs. Down here in Miami, uh, it's been an interesting situation because, um, you know, Mark Rick retired. There, there was not a coaching search. Uh, the athletic director went right to Manny Diaz. And, you know, which in, in, when you go six and seven out of the gate like they did last year and you lose to FIU and Duke and Louisiana Tech, to end the season, um, myself and a lot of other people are sitting there saying, what the heck, you know, like, you know, why wasn't there a coaching search? Why didn't Miami go out and get the best guy? And the response that you always get, and it, 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 has, it has caught a little bit of fire with the fan base to a degree, is, you know, maybe Manny Diaz is Miami's Dabo Swinney. And, you know, Dabo struggled his first few years. Um, it did not look like he was going to be the guy that was going to be able to turn around Clemson. And then they, they, they got him, you know, Chad Morris to remake the offense, who's a, a very high quality offensive coordinator. And then of course they go get uh, Venables, who's as good as any defensive coordinator in the country. And now he's got elite coaching around them and they built the coaching staff from there. And now he's sitting here. He, he's got nine straight 10 win seasons. He's, he's playing for the national title almost every year. Um, it's the model program in college football. And, you know, people in Miami are now hoping that, you know, Manny Diaz could do the same thing. Who the heck is counting tickets up there? There is no way in hell that there's going to be 20,000 people in that stadium. I turned on the TV on Saturday night, and I'm watching them play Virginia. And I'm saying, Jesus, this 80,000-seat stadium looks like it's like half to two-thirds full. There is no way they're <laughs> limiting that crowd to 20,000. And if they didn't do it against Virginia, they sure as heck aren't doing it against Miami on Saturday. <laughs> I mean, this is a Herculean challenge for Miami on Saturday night. And... Like I said at the beginning of the show, I love it. I love every minute yep. of it. Um, I I hate garbage games. You know, I said at the beginning of the year, Greg, I, I, I think I said it on this show also, that when they opened the season against UAB, to me, that was the smartest thing I've seen at Miami in a long time. Because it, usually you open with like a Bethune-Cookman, a FAMU, yeah. a blowout victory, yeah. and everybody in college football thinks that that's like such a great thing. I don't think it's a great thing. I don't think you get anything out of those games. And I think a huge reason why Miami looked so good against Louisville and so good against Florida State was that they were tested at the beginning of the year. They had to respond um, UAB pulled to within three points in the third quarter, and they had to take it to another That's level, right. and they were able to do it. And I hardened them for Louisville, and it hardened them for Florida State. Yeah, I just think in the bigger picture, it was great for Miami to go play a, a high-quality team and, and get That's an right. accurate, realistic gauge of where they are in building their program. To me, that's more important than anything. It's more important than the win-loss record this year. Uh, I'm not a believer in living in a delusional state. And yeah. the minute Miami wins a game or two, people are ready to start yelling, Miami's back, Miami's back. Oh, and that, yeah. that could play with your head a little bit uh, as a football program and a football team. And, you know, Miami's not back. Th th this is the beginning of what hopefully will be a path back eventually. But, uh, you know, I, I think it's important that People stay grounded and, and inside the program, outside the program. Understand that this is a work in progress. And as it pertains to Manny Diaz and his staff and the players, an understanding of how much work is left to be done 
I think is a good thing at this th at this point. Let's talk about uh, the key part of the game, really, the couple of key things. And we talked about the penalties before, and it came up again. Matter of fact, Miami right now, uh, they are ranking near the bottom, 68 out of 76 teams that are in the uh, college football uh, pool this year. Uh, that's uh, where they rank as far as penalties. 37 penalties. That's 9.3 a game. And you're not going to talk. To, we're not. We didn't talk too much about it because they were winning. We talked about it, but we didn't harp on it. But when you play the really good football teams, these types of penalties are going to come back to haunt you. And they also just could not get off the field on third down. Got to play more discipline, uh, Greg. And, you know, I'm watching the same thing this game after game with the safeties, you know, getting their heads down and, and tackling with the crown of their helmet and getting targeting calls. You know, some of them, like, you know, the one last week, I thought one of them was a little questionable on Keontra Smith. But the point is, you know, now you guys have a target on your back. You have to really be clean with your tackling techniques and things like that. And those 15-yard penalties, they add up in, in a game, and you certainly can't afford them when you're playing a, a, a team like Clemson. So there, there are a lot of little issues, I, I think, up there that if they get a chance to play Clemson again at the end of the year, that they'll try to clean up. But uh, like I said at the beginning of the show, Greg, I, I just personally think, you know, I love measurement games. I really do. I, I think they're so important for programs. And, you know, this was a good measurement for Miami to see where they are. Now they know where they need to get better. And it starts, um, that challenge starts Saturday against Pittsburgh, which won't have the athletes that Clemson has, but, but they do have a good enough defense that they're capable of putting together a solid game and challenging the Hurricanes a little bit in that regard, which I think is good because, you know, now, now you can kind of gauge your progress week to week. Uh, as far as you mentioned their defense, they have uh, several Pro prospects on defense. Uh, they have an explosive senior edge rusher, Patrick Jones. He already has seven sacks this season. He had eight and a half of all last year, including four force, uh, forced fumbles. And Rashad Weaver has four and a half sacks. So both Jones and Weaver along the defensive line are both top a top line pro prospects, pass rushing prospects on the D line. And safety Paris Ford might be might be the best safety in the entire nation. He has two interceptions, 31 tackles, three and a half tackles for loss. He led the team last year with 97 tackles, three forced fumbles, and three interceptions. And also, wow, you feel that you feel that strong about him? Oh huh? yeah, best, Paris Ford best in the nation. Yes. Wow. Yeah, Paris Ford is a major talent. Pitt 0 5 and one against the spread in their last six ACC games. So that's wow. a, that's a good trend for oh five and one oh five huh? and one against the spread in their last six ACC well, that games. Would, that would point to a big Miami victory, right? You would hope so. But and Miami has beaten Pitt the last two years straight up and against the spread after the upset in 2017 when Pickett was a freshman and Miami was ten or no. And I don't have to remind you guys, uh, Miami four and one straight up and against the spread their last five because the Miami Hurricanes come off another home win. This one off the Pitt Panthers and an important win, Gary, because as we talked about last week, it was tough to lose the way that they did in Clemson and very, and you could tell in this game because Pitt's still a very well coached team, very strong defense. And we saw that in this game and it was important for Miami to get over the hump and because it was a sloppy type game. And, and I thought that was really good to see that even though it was sloppy, they, they kept, churning offensively the defense came up with big plays and they were just a better team than Pitt, and they didn't give the game away as much as they tried to but they were very resilient and that's something we have not seen from this program over the last few years no perfect perfectly said greg and you know the, the biggest thing for miami and it's something that manny diaz has been stressing to his team week after week is that they're they're actually winning the games and you know that's a step forward for this program because there were too many games like last week's game that they were losing the the past couple years and uh, you know you don't go from from the bottom to the top all in one step it, it, it usually involves incremental steps and and winning these games without question is an incremental step for the Hurricanes it, it wasn't pretty but like you said they struggled to run the ball. 
They struggled quite a bit on third downs. The offense really had to be bailed out by a couple of uh, huge explosive plays that Rhett Lashley, the offensive coordinator, was able to draw up. But um, at the end of the day, they, they walked out of there with a you know convincing victory. And that's, without question, progress for a program that last year was losing to Virginia Tech, was losing to Georgia Tech in games exactly like what we saw yeah. on set. Harrison Hunt got the sack, uh, forced the fumble, but Pittsburgh did recover. They kicked the field goal 14-3, but we got to talk about Harrison Hunt. Uh, this is a very young kid. He is, he is now developing into a very key part of this defense and give him some more development over the next year or two, and he has star written all over him. Yeah, uh, you know, well, star, star we'll see, but, you know, he's without question one of the rising young talents on the team. A, a real athletic kid. He was a basketball player in high school, and they're, they're taking that raw ability and they're, they're building on it. They're building his frame up, and, you know, now as a second-year player, he's at the point where they feel comfortable putting him in games. And he leads the team in sacks, Greg. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's kind of amazing. You know, you think of Roche and Phillips on the outside, but— um, but Hunt, uh, you know, he he leads the team in sacks and is, is just doing doing a phenomenal job when they put him in there. They're not like overloading him or anything like that. I think they're doing a really nice job of bringing him along. But uh, I think the second half of the season, we're going to see his reps continue to go up because he is producing when he's out there. The Paris Ford interception off the deflected pass, he returned it to the twelve, but a great run stop, and he had two. Excellent run stops. Quincy Roche on third down uh, limited Pittsburgh to another field goal, 14-6. Uh, so, yeah, even though it was a bad break, the deflection, the interception, the great field position, Miami's defense held again. You know, R Roche had his best game as a hurricane. And, uh, you know, you really didn't know truthfully what to expect from him coming in. We knew he was a good pass rusher at Temple. I think uh, ACC football is, uh, you know, even though it's not the SEC, I think ACC is at a higher level than what he had been playing at at Temple. So we didn't really know what to expect. And he's not putting sacks on the board the way he did there. I think he's got two and a half now for, for the season. But it was nice to see him just, you know, make plays the way he did. He graded out exceptionally in that game, which which I think is a big deal for him. He's obviously you know, trying to build an NFL resume for himself. And he's probably going to end up being an outside linebacker in the pros. So I think it's like really important for him to make plays in the run game too and show the pro scouts, you know, what he can do in terms of that, that he's not just a one-dimensional pass Absolutely. rusher. Absolutely. Yeah, so and especially uh, all if all, he winds up playing, you know, because uh, and and it's definitely of the three four variety. You're going to get him out on the edge, and you're going to yes. be able to have a guy that, especially on passing downs, you're going to he's he's going to be a three down guy. He's going to be able to stay out there on passing downs and rush the passer, and he's proven that he can be not only a pass rusher but also a run stop. Well, the one thing that Rhett Lashley is doing a great job of is. He's walking into the stadium on Saturday with, you know, three or four like really craftily designed plays in his back pocket that when he needs them, he can pull out and feel relatively comfortable that he's going to get a big play out of it. And, and, and it's been showing up in every single game. And <laughs> to me, it's what sets this guy apart from a lot of offensive coordinators. Pitt, after three field goals, was able to get it to 21-16. Uh, you had uh, another huge play by Roche and by Phillips combining for the strip sack uh, at the pit 38-yard line. And uh, Mallory then uh, ends up wide open for a 45-yard touchdown, 28-16 game over. Yeah, and that, and that play right there with Mallory is an example of what I'm talking about. That was about. a beautiful uh, play, by the way. Beautiful diagram you know, er play. Well, earlier in the game, they, they showed Mallory as a blocking back. So they, they had already shown that. And and now they ran a wrinkle off of that where, where Mallory lining up in the backfield goes through the line like he's a blocking yeah, pullback. Yeah. And just nobody's there to pick him up. Yeah. And he just and he just keeps going. Yeah. yeah. And it, it very well designed, very well thought out. It worked exactly as it was intended to. And he had a walk in touchdown. Yeah. So uh, and those are the kind of plays, Greg, that Rhett Lashley is dialing up this entire season so far.